A very good morning to you. I'm Howard Feldman. This is the Sunday Synthesis Podcast with me, Howard Feldman, and Dr. Anton Myberg. We are in the middle of the third wave. Gauteng looking very, very scary the last week, being particularly difficult for many people to get through, those of them who actually did. Dr. Anton Myberg, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, sir. As you correctly say, we currently are in the third wave, as we have said, for a number of weeks, specifically in Gauteng, but also throughout the country. Currently, the numbers are sitting at 176,424,080 cases worldwide, with 3.8 million deaths and 160 million cases resolved. The United States has 34.3 million cases with 614,000 deaths. India has 29.4 million cases with 370,000 deaths. And South Africa has 1,739,425 cases with 57,706 deaths and 9,320 new cases in the last 24 hours, a test positivity rate of 16.6%. There are currently 3,782 patients in hospital in Gauteng with COVID, of which 870 in ICU and 429 are ventilated. And interestingly enough, the Hatsola numbers, there are 412 active cases with 65 new cases in the last 24 hours, of which 44 of the total number of 412 are below the age of 18. So that is dramatic, and that's very different to the last two waves. We're seeing a high number, obviously, in younger people, but the numbers in the community are extremely high. Are the numbers in the community more high or uh, higher this wave than both the first and the second wave? We've definitely gone above the peak of the second wave and the first wave. Um, the numbers are dramatically high, and people are asking the question, why? Um, is it because people are testing more frequently? Yes, we are testing more frequently, but it boils down to one important thing. People are not following the rules. The rules are there. Don't socialize. Don't socially interact with people. Wear your mask. Keep your distance. Stay away from people who are sick. If you do not follow the rules, we will be clapped. We need to follow the rules. Simple. I'm going to ask you to stop clapping the table because every time you do that, your camera jumps up and down, but that's all right. At least we know that you're serious about this. It, it, is that the reason? I mean, uh, in fact, one of the questions that I got earlier from, uh, in fact, from Baruch, he said, uh, I know that, uh, that, uh, that our numbers are disproportionately higher in our community. Do you think it's because maybe more people are vaccinated and therefore are asymptomatic and whilst walking around? Or is it a combination of people being lax in terms of, um, in terms of protocols? So with regard to people being vaccinated, yes, there are more people being vaccinated or have been vaccinated, but we're looking at a small proportion of people that have been vaccinated. The majority of people have not been vaccinated. However, of the people that have been vaccinated, those people have become very lax. And that's a very good point because people have to realize after you've had the first Pfizer injection, you are not covered. You may have about a 30 to 35% immunogenicity or a 35% um, evolution of antibodies in your system and an immunity developing, but you are not covered. Even after the second Pfizer, which most people have not got yet and will have to wait the 42 days as per government ruling, you will still not be fully covered you are still prone and you will still be able to pick up the virus and transmit it to other people. So even getting vaccinated at this point in time is not a silver bullet. It's extremely important so we can develop containment and herd immunity and try and stop the virus from spreading, but it's not a get out of jail free. Are you seeing a lot of breakthrough infections? So we're not seeing a lot, but we are seeing breakthrough infections. And once again, you know, we're seeing it in medical personnel, we're seeing people who have been vaccinated on medical personnel. Um, most of the people, I'd say the majority, about 95%, are not extremely ill, have got mild symptoms, got a sore throat, a bit of a cough, a temperature, but don't need to go to hospital and don't need to go on cortisone or any of those other medications. So that's at least a, at least a very positive sign. What are you seeing at the hospitals <laughs> at the moment? How many wards are open? So it's anarchy. It's anarchy at the hospital at the moment. Um, and I'm not even talking about my hospital, I'm talking about all the hospitals. Multiple wards open. At my hospital, we've got six wards open. We've got a full ICU, we've got a full high care. We are on divert because we do not have beds for ICU or high care. Our actual COVID wards, where they are not ICU, are basically full. I know this morning we had five beds left. So, I mean, that just tells you the numbers, how bad it is. People are ill. People are extremely ill. And there's no doubt that what we're seeing now 
is that people are much sicker than they were during the second wave, and they'll end up staying in hospital for a longer duration. They've got a lot, lot more sequelae, a lot more consequences of the disease. So it's a, it's a battlefield, as I've said before, and uh, we're in the trenches and we're in the dungeons at the moment because it's so bad. And we haven't reached so, the peak yet, and we're going into winter now in a, in a big way, so we're still going to see other viruses, like all the influenzas, respiratory assistance, the virus, all those other viruses. So we're, we've got a long way to go. And yet all I heard was there's only five beds, so grab it while stock's lost. Uh, basically. And that's right. just at our hospital, not other hospitals, which are also suffering the same problem. Right. Very, very scary indeed. Lots, uh, lots of questions, of course, around this Johnson & Johnson finding that the FDA seems to have rejected the use of a lot of the vaccines. Can you give us some perspective? What is going on with this? So there was a certain batch from Baltimore that was contaminated. The ingredients that they used in the actual vaccine were contaminated and they cannot use that vaccine. They cannot send it out to the general public. You know, each country has got their own board that sort of quantifies whether this medicine is safe. We've got SARPRA, the Americans have got the FDA and the CDC that all look at all these things. And they've deemed that the batch that they've got of the millions that they've got are not safe. However, there are 300,000 vaccines that they have deemed are safe and they will be sending to South Africa in a short while, which they're going to be using to vaccinate teachers who are also seen as frontline workers and people who are going to be educating our kids. But this is going to set South Africa's vaccine program back yet again and quite significantly. Dr dramatically. It's a big problem. Yeah, very, very concerning. And the news could not have come at a worse time as we, as we are in the middle of this third wave. Let's just talk about, we, we're going to come back to a lot of questions. We have a tremendous amount of questions today. And as always, thank you for sending them through. Tell us about schools. So a lot of the, the schools have met, they've met with, with doctors, they've met with academics, they've met with school boards. And a decision for the majority of schools has been to close the schools down now. We know that the major spread of the virus comes from social activities, especially functions and in ceremonies. But we also know that there's a large asymptomatic spread of this virus. So more than 45% are walking, people are walking around with the virus, not knowing that they actually have it and can transmit it to other people. We know that we're seeing higher numbers in children than we did in the first and the second wave. And it's been deemed necessary to close the schools down. Most of the schools are either closed completely or kept one or two grades open. Um, the high schools are busy writing exams, so they've managed to justify, and I think rightly so, that the kids are only going to be at school for two hours, spread out, social distance, and then off the campus. And that's the correct decision. You know, once again, we've got to balance the trauma, the anxiety, everything we deal with from a kid's point of view, and try and balance it with what we are dealing with on a global level. And it's more of a national level at this point. Mm -hmm. All right. Taking a look at some of the questions, Terry says, if a person, if a certain vaccine site is prepared to give you the second Pfizer before 42 days, should you take it? Look, I think we've got to be ethical in this decision that we're making. The government have said that they've made it 42 days for the reason of the fact that they don't have enough vaccines at this point to give everybody. And we'd rather have more people getting one vaccine then only some people getting two vaccines and not other people getting any. And we've got to really, really take that under our wings and say, this, we've got a responsibility, you know? You know, the responsibility is, yes, have your first vaccine, but wait the 42 days so that we can try and get or procure more vaccine and make sure that other people can get vaccinated. It's so important mm. that everybody gets at least one vaccination to start the process off. Is it a myth that blood type and being vegetarian plays a role in how badly you'll react to COVID? Yeah, because if you can't have a steak, then you're going to oh, no. That's really what I was just thinking. Then, yeah, then yeah. what's the point in living anyway? Uh, honestly, yeah, it's a myth. Yeah. It's all yeah. a myth. Um, you know, there's yeah. some people that say that if you're a vegetarian, it helps with your immunity. Um, sorry, I, I don't buy that. Okay. Is it okay to have a vaccine whilst you have a cold? So the answer in general is no. If you're sick, if you've got symptoms, if you're coughing, if you've got a fever, 
rather don't have the vaccine and tell you better. We don't know the interaction of the vaccine on your immunity when you've already got an underlying infection and it could cause other problems to develop. And then we don't know if your symptoms are from the vaccine or from your cold, or if you get a pneumonia or something developing from the actual cold, we don't know how to differentiate that from the vaccine and our treatment further. Right. Is there any truth to the rumor that if they have a shortage of Pfizer injections, when you reach your 42 days, that they'll give you a J&J vaccine? No, because we've only got 300,000 J&J vaccines coming in, and sure. those are going to go to the teachers, so there's no truth in that. Yeah, absolutely crazy. Uh, Kim says, is, is there any evidence to say that the Jewish community has been harder hit than other communities, both in respect of contagion as well as the higher incidence of death? Look, the Jewish community is a small community, but what we're seeing at this sort of time where we're going through this wave is that a large amount of our community are being hit very hard with this virus. And it's due to the fact that, first of all, people are fatigued. They've had enough. They, they actually don't want to deal with it anymore. So most people think what they're doing is safe, but they're actually not acting safely. They're not following the rules. And because we're not in an effective lockdown, because we're only in a sort of a lower lockdown and the government hasn't propped up that, that lockdown. And I'm not saying we've got to go into an economic lockdown. That's a whole different discussion. But there needs to be certain more restrictions to help us along the way to try and prevent us from spreading this infection. So we are seeing that in our community, we are being hit harder. There's no doubt about it. And uh, it's a very worrying thing. So should uh, shuls, synagogues, mosques, churches be more curtailed, for example? Definitely. Definitely, there should be a much higher curtailment on all of these religious gatherings. I mean, I know that the, the gatherings, say, if you're outside, you can have 100 people. If you're inside, you can have 50%. But they should be curtailed. The number should be less, more spread out. And people over the age of 60, whether vaccinated or not, should not be coming to these religious gatherings. All right. And bald people? So, I mean, making a joke, but the truth of the matter is people who are obese, People who are, are bored, if you want to put that thing, it's not the major thing, but I'm saying look right. at people with comorbidities, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, COPD, emphysema, um, you know, all those type of things. Those people should stay away. You know, look right. after your general health, okay? You have to put yourself first and contain yourself so that you don't get sick, so that you don't get the virus, so, even if you've been so vaccinated. Here's, so here's my, <coughs> excuse me, here's my question. So you're coughing and you're bored, uh, I'm just saying. And do you know, can you recommend a decent doctor? So when, when I made a joke before when you were quite emphatically, I mean, we look at body language, by the way, that when somebody gestures like this, they just, they can't do more to get their, their, their point across. You say this every week. Every week you're saying the same thing. Wear your mask, social distance, sanitize, da 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 da, da. Clearly, it's not working because the incidents are horrifically high. People are dying. Um, I, I don't recall the law, it being as bad as, as we have seen in the last week. How do we get that point across in a different way? Is there another way to get this point across? I think the point comes across now that people are saying, hold on, the schools are closing. That's saying, hold on, you know, before we used to say that the schools were the safest place for our children. But now we're closing the schools. That really should trigger something in our, in our minds to say that uh, we're in trouble. You know, we as a community should be saying, curtail the synagogues, curtail all the religious gatherings. That's the only way we're going to do it. Because as you say, we're drumming these things every week, wear your mask, social but, distance, but it's, but it's stay not, away, it's but not it's not helping. working. It's not no. working. Okay? And unless it comes from our leadership drumming these points and giving the guidance, coming from our rabbis, coming from our heads of community, unless these people get up and actually say these things, then it's going to be very difficult for us to keep on drumming them through without people actually saying, you know, they're just uh, prophets of doom or those people who actually just keep on speaking negatively about things. But the reality is what we're seeing, what we're seeing in our RCUs, what we're seeing around us. I mean, there's not, as I said, there's not one person we don't know now that hasn't lost somebody to COVID or isn't currently positive with SARS-CoV-2 or isn't in hospital. Everybody knows somebody, and that's frightening. When you look at places like America, one of my colleagues in America says today they just celebrated 
their first week of not having a COVID patient in their ICU. This time last year, they had 100 patients, 27 ventilated. Today, they've got not one. So, you know, that's also due to the fact that, that is unfortunately all about the and, vaccines. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm saying, you know, that's, that's the difference where we're at. So we're in a big, big dump of problems at the moment. And we've got to try and fight above no, that. We, we've hit a perfect recognize. storm. Yeah. Yeah. Got to recognize we've hit a perfect that storm because, because we, we don't have enough vaccines. We've certainly got more problems with the vaccines now. We're in winter. We're in the middle of the third wave. It really is a, th- it really is a perfect storm. I'm not pushing you to, to say this at all, but, but do you think, therefore, that religious leadership, and I don't mean just within the Jewish community, but across the board, should be doing more to get that message across as well? Do you, do you feel, as a doctor, that you're screaming against the wind but not getting enough support we, we, we're definitely not getting enough support it's coming from the doctors only you know we need the people around yeah. us the leaders of the communities the religious leaders especially whether it's jewish christian muslim hindu whatever it is we need them to stand up and say people listen you need to curtail your behavior you need to curtail services you need to curtail things so that we can prevent this from spreading because we don't want this peak to go high, and it's going to go high, unfortunately. And also, if we really look down the line, we don't want a fourth wave to develop either. We've got to drop this and finish this now. Mm-hmm. Is there any sense of how long this third wave will last, how far we are from the peak? No, none of the academics can predict this. I mean, we haven't even hit the peak yet, and that, that's a very mm-hmm. worrying thing. We're sitting at 9,000 cases last, 9,300 cases last night, and I don't believe we're even close to the peak. So there's no sense of where we're going and how long it will last for, and if it will follow the first and the second wave trajectories, we just don't know yet. I hope it says, uh, last week, Dr. Myberg mentioned that the Pfizer vaccine is safe for pregnant and breastfeeding women, although it seems that the next available vaccine, well, she wrote this when we still thought we were getting the J&J, but I, I believe we'll still get more of them. Uh, the J&J vaccine, especially reaching the younger age groups, is, there, is the, um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine also a good option for pregnant and breastfeeding women? Look, there's, you know, people are sitting on the fence about this one. We know for a fact that if you get COVID when you're pregnant, it is a devastating thing if you haven't got a vaccination. So without vaccination, you can get extremely ill. If you are vaccinated, there's less chance of you getting ill. And we've got to take that into account. The Pfizer vaccine is still being mandated by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology to be given to patients. When we were giving the Johnson & Johnson and the Sasanke trial, due to the fact that seven or eight people out of the number of millions of people got those uh, cerebral venous sinus thromboses, they actually stopped giving it to pregnant people. So it depends on what SARPRA say and what our governing bodies say about giving the Johnson & Johnson to pregnant people. But right now, according to that, I would rather a pregnant person gets a Pfizer than a Johnson & Johnson. Yet I don't believe there's an issue with a Johnson & Johnson and a pregnant right. person. I'm saying if, you, if you've got no major risk factors to, and, you, and, you, yeah. and you can get a Johnson & Johnson but nothing else, then you've got to speak to your obstetrician, you've got to speak to your physician, decide do the sort of benefits outweigh the risks. I need to go back to this 42-day thing because there are so many people asking the same questions and it comes out of a place of anxiety. Estelle mm-hmm. says, hi, Dr. Marburg, please advise. I'm over 70. I've had the first dose of Pfizer four weeks ago. Should I wait out the 42 days or try and go sooner? My fear is the vaccines will run out. You know, unfortunately, what's happened in South Africa is we don't have the confidence in the procurement process as much as we want to say that we do we really really don't and and that's making people incredibly anxious and and i understand that and i get that and as i said earlier you know it's an ethical decision you know are you going to take the second vaccine so that you are protected and somebody else who's over the age of 60 or 65 companies can't get their first vaccine so it's a decision you've got to make that you've got to live with your decision i say you've got to go to bed at night knowing that you've done the right thing if you believe that's the right thing for you and you can live with that decision, then you've got to go with it. Right now, the government have put out the 42 days because that's what they deem is what they can do. Okay. So, you, you know, I'm not here to judge people. I'm not here to say, don't do it. You shouldn't do it. I'm just saying we've got to follow certain rules and these are what's been laid out. And we are scared that we aren't going to get the second dose. And we are scared that there's not going to be enough vaccine, but we've just got to hope and, and hang in there. Mm-hmm. 
The uh, Roxanne wants to know a person who cannot afford to pay the 850 rand or at least can't afford to get tested, they've got to go to a public clinic and wait in a long queue and you're only allowed to go if there if you're showing symptoms what that means is that the less fortunate are going out waiting in queues and getting tested and as well as infecting other people is there not something better to be done um, in in terms of this well, look i mean if you've got symptoms and you're worried about going to stay in the queue then isolate at home stay at home for that 10 to 14 day period until your symptoms have gone because at the end of the day by paying the 850 and you're getting a result saying you're positive, you're still going to go home and isolate or quarantine. So in essence, it's the same thing. So you can avoid that going in those queues and staying with people. And, and there is a definitive belief that the vaccination queues are a hub of spreading the virus as well, because people are standing all on top of each other in lines all together. People are wearing their masks, some are putting their masks below their nose, and people are on top of each other. So those have to be a super spreading area, even though it's a place where you're going to try and prevent the virus from spreading, but those are in themselves problematic. Well, there's in fact been a lot of talk, and I don't know if it's been substantiated or not, that people have picked up COVID whilst waiting in the lines for the for the vaccine. I'm sure. I, I can't deny that. You know, as you, when you see what the queues look like and you see the amount of people on top of each other, they can't be a doubt to that. There has to be that has to be part of the process of spreading the, the virus to mm. people. Can we talk we know, about? We know that people just, are asymptomatic, so yeah. asymptomatic people are going to be standing there, not knowing they've got the virus, and talking to each other, and you know, conversing. You're standing in a queue for two or three hours. It gets a bit boring. So there's a high chance you could spread it. Yeah. The answer is to go there with a mask and a visor and try and stay sort of out of people's way as much as possible if you are going. I'd be a real danger in that environment, I can tell you. Um, a proper super spreader potential. The, the other question that a number of people are asking is, can you please assist us in defining close contact? As more of our kids are coming in contact with people, with other kids who, who are COVID positive, we, we're bumping into people who are, what is defined as close contact? So I think we've got to be very careful about putting a blanket term of, of close contact. I think, you know, we differ very much in the schools with regards to what the CDC say. The CDC say if one person in the class is positive, you've got to close the whole class down. We haven't done that since the beginning of the actual pandemic, and it's, it's done very well for us. We've managed because the kids have been socially distanced, they've been wearing masks. But the biggest issue is if people are not wearing masks. So if you're in contact with somebody, in a room with somebody, and either one of you is not wearing a mask, whether it be for 30 seconds or whether it be for 15 minutes, you can spread the virus in two seconds. So it doesn't have to be an elastic blanket rule of 15 minutes. It's any amount of time you spend with somebody in a room who turns out to be positive where either one of you are not wearing a mask. And even if you were both wearing masks, but there was no ventilation in the room and you weren't socially distanced, you still have close contact then and you still go to quarantine. So you go out for coffee with somebody, you're sitting outside, but you take off your mask, you're sitting at the same table, you take off your mask to drink coffee, and you've been reasonably well, uh, you've been reason reasonably disciplined. Is that a close contact? Well, it is a close contact because first of all, no one's sitting a meter and a half away from each other when they're going to have coffee with each other. You're not going to be shouting mm. across the table to each other. So you're taking no. off your mask, you're drinking coffee. That's a close contact. Even though you're outside, you're still fulfilling criteria of being in contact with somebody. And as we say, we know of so many people that are asymptomatic and transferring the virus. So we've just got to be so careful with that. Are you still reasonably confident that this wave is behaving in the same way as another wave, as the last wave? So in some aspects, yes. We still believe it's the same, it's the same variant as the second wave, okay? Um, there's no doubt it's the, the beta um, variant mm -hmm. that we're seeing dramatically the most of our cases. And it's more of the beta variant from the second wave than we're seeing the variant from the first wave. And we are seeing minimal delta variants and alpha variants, but the majority of cases we're seeing are the beta variant. What we are seeing are people are very sick at the moment in hospital. And as I said, they do end up staying in hospital for a longer duration of time. The beta variant, the South African variant, is a highly transmissible virus and a highly contagious virus and makes people extremely ill. So it is very much similar to the second wave in the way it's behaving, but we are seeing a large amount of people getting infected. 
Shirley says, how come hospitals are still allowing visitors? I went to drop off a parcel and it seemed like a railway station. I thought hospitals weren't allowing visitors. They're not. Well, most hospitals aren't. I know our hospital, for a fact, has stopped visitors. We only allow visitors in for critically ill patients that um, we believe are not going to, to survive. And then we allow one or two visitors only in the full PPE to come visit. Other people can drop stuff off at security to, to give parcels to people. Um, it's only a matter of time before they cut down elective surgery much more. In my view, it should be cut down dramatically um, because the hospitals just don't have the capacity. Mm. Annette wants to know, have any vaccinated people, J&J or First Visor, passed away? So I, I know that one person, I've heard of one person out of the whole um, sort of multitude of people that have been vaccinated in Africa, only one person passed away that I know of. Um, I know of a few people that have been in hospital, one or two that have been in ICU. Um, it's not an impossibility. We always got to understand that, that nothing is, a, once again, a silver bullet or a magic bullet that's going to stop it. But for more than 95% of people, there will be a definitive decrease in symptoms. There will be a no need to go to hospital. There will be no need to be put on major medications. So nothing's impossible. Um, in fact, one of the other things we're seeing now, interestingly enough, is with the Pfizer vaccine in young people, especially young males, there are now cases of myocarditis and pericarditis, which is damage to the heart muscle, swelling of the heart muscle. Um, and this has been noted in these young people. And from what we can see from that is maybe to advise people that if they do the vaccine... Yeah, that was actually going to be my that, next. Yeah. If they do have the vaccine, then wait five to seven days after the vaccine before you start doing exercise again, just to give your body a rest, just to give your heart muscle a rest, so we can try and prevent these things from happening. And uh, somebody wants to know, thanks for the email, uh, has there been any change in thinking around general surfaces as a source of contamination? No, much the same. You know, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we used to go mad and we used to actually try and stop stop people from touching things and keep people from actually, you know, putting their, their, their wet wipes on all the things and taking the groceries mm. and putting them in the side. But, you know, just wash your hands, sanitize, you know, keep everything away from what you have to, but don't drive yourself mad about things like that. For 16 months or however long it is, we've been telling people to adhere to the regulations. We've got to get through it. The light, there's the, you know, we see the end. We can get there. People are exhausted. Yeah. They are fatigued. Um, they're emotionally spent, negative. I, I, I chatted to a friend yesterday who said to me, also had the experience of a number of funerals this week, and he said, normally, the, you know, you'd have a bad experience, but there'd be the flip side of it where you'd see friends and you'd go out for meals. And, 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 and what he said was right. It, it's very, very difficult for people. And at the same time, we are literally banging on about be safe, be careful, what, what, what bit of um, maybe strength or encouragement can we give to people to help us all? And I, and, and, and I speak for myself as well, because I did have a hard week last week around this. How, how do we get through this? What advice can we give so, to people? I think that's a very important point. And I think the point is, I, just, I said it earlier, you know, when I spoke to my friend, one of my colleagues in America, they threw it. You know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, there is a, a silver lining behind that cloud. We've got to get through that hurdle to get there. And it may take us a bit longer, but we know that when we get the right vaccination, when we get people vaccinated, we will get through this. You know, I always try and sort of compare it to the previous polio pandemic. You know, when people were dying from polio and young people had to go into iron lungs where they actually used to go into a machine to try and help them breathe. And at that stage, people thought it's the end of the world. People, everyone's dying. What are they going to do? But there's a lot. I mean, you know, we've got to realize in one year, we managed to come up with a vaccine that's never mm. been done in medical science before. Okay, There's so much we've learned from this, from this virus and so many things we can do to help people and try and prevent people from getting further ill. But it's a tough time because we're all going through it and we all are getting depressed and we're all getting lockdown sort of symptoms and we all are struggling because we're people of communication and we're people of mm -hmm. socialization Social and beings, that's yeah. been taken away from us. So just know that there definitely is that silver lining. And as much as we now having a very serious podcast today and we're going through a very bad time, you know, this too shall pass. 
And that's unfortunately all we have time for. Dr. Anton Myberg, thank you as always. Very, very difficult, very difficult time for you, for everybody, for the entire country. And I do think that we need to find ways to support each other, look out for people who need our support a little bit more than they did need it. And uh, let's try and get through this together as much as we possibly can. Yeah, let me just say one more thing is that, you know, I think it's important to note that and, and I've got to give one of my quotes at least to just end off the podcast, you know. When when life shuts oh, a door, yes. open it again. It's a door. That's how they work. So this too shall pass. We will get there. We've got to carry on fighting. We cannot give up now. We're now at a stage where we've got to give it our everything and push on forward and work together as a community, as a country, and get this thing going so we can get rid of it. Good luck. Be safe and just look after yourselves. I'm Howard Feldman for the Synthesis Sunday podcast. Don't forget to subscribe below. Please send us your questions. Be safe, take care, and God bless.